Welcome, welcome, one and all, back to another video, and today we're going to be taking a look at a little bit of a tech tangent, if you will, and showcasing a little bit of a project I'm working on. So, let's bring it in. Now, this right here is an all-in-one computer. It's somewhat new. It ran Windows 7 back in the day, and it was a upscale model when it came out. Nowadays, it's been sort of relinquished to the dust pile, but it has found new life. You see, while browsing through the interwebs, I looked on a site called Nextdoor and noticed that somebody was in desperate need of a computer. And seeing how I had this available, I figured it would be a great opportunity to be able to present this. And so I will. Now, in its current state, of course, it's not really in a great shape. It was wiped by the previous person that I got it from, but again, Windows 7, and they put some weird password on it that I don't know of, so I really wanted to be able to get in here, wipe everything, and put Windows 10 on this, and really make this more interesting. So we're going to tear this open a little bit, as gently as possible, and get a look at what's inside an all-in-one. Now, of course, the tricky part about this is, A, I've never really disassembled one of these before, and B, trying to figure out how to do it well, having not done it before, without any tutorials, because there's so many of these things, you can't just look up a guy and how to disassemble this specific model, like OEMs at this point, and to do so without breaking anything and making it nice enough so when you give it back to them, they will be totally fine. Or I'll give it to them, I'm not giving it back to anybody, but yeah. Uh, I started off pretty easily by just taking off this plastic cover. This covers off some of the I.O. on the side. Includes some of the power cables and other necessary information. It just routes through this little cable stress at the back that goes out through the side. But we're going to get into this. I'm going to undo some of the screws and do a little light, gentle prying, and we'll see where we get from here. It looks like it has clips, but I don't want to push too hard and then be proven wrong when some post snaps. Well, wouldn't you know it? There's a screw right there. Of course there is. So you're not really going to be able to see this one. It's in a pretty annoying spot. I'm going to block either the camera or the screw. Okay, so I've taken this piece off here. This appears to be some sort of service entrance for the computer. A little baloney this service entrance is, but whatever. Put the screw off to the side. If you look in here, we can see our RAM DIMMs right here. We pull one of these out for him, we'll see what they look like. So each of these RAM DIMMs is just a 2 gigabyte DDR2 normal frequency RAM, likely running at uh, it looks like 666 megahertz, if I'm reading that correctly. They were a little dusty, but not too bad. There's two of DIMMs in there, so looks like we have four gigs of memory in there. I could potentially upgrade that, but since these are matching RAM sticks, I don't think I have anything more powerful than this. I think we'll be plenty fine to have our four gigs. And that should be totally fine for Windows. The woman that's going to be using this computer does primarily internet browsing and basic office applications, some light gaming, and you can game on 4 gigs. It's not too bad. So now that the service entrance has been revealed, it is of course immediately obvious we got a lot more screws to undo. So I'm going to take out the other piece of RAM here from its dim slot, which is really annoying to work with here, this tiny cramped space, but we'll get it out. And we got us a bunch of screws. Looks like we've got screws here, 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 here. A screw here. It's a different kind. Another kind here, here, and here. So that's going to be fun. Oh, it looks like we have a screw here too as well. So I'm going to undo some more of these screws. Looks like a couple more in here as well. And then we'll see what ends up happening. I can see that massive hard drive in there. I can't tell yet if it's going to be one hard drive or two. It looks like it's a three and a half inch. 
which honestly I wasn't expecting, but that's kind of nice. I'm going to grab my magnet and we'll take some of these screws out before they get into trouble. I picked up these fridge magnetic holders. They come in a pack of two at uh, the Dollar Tree, which is a local dollar store, dollar general type place near where I live. They only come with one magnet on it on the bottom. Since they come in a two pack, I just took out one of the magnets and put them on the inside. So now they're a pretty nice, inexpensive screw holder. So it comes with a lid. I don't really care about the lid, but yeah, it's nice to have it. I'll just be tossing the screws in there. I'm realizing that I should have done these first, seeing as how they belong to the stand and they're in a more awkward spot than the bottom two. But, yeah, live and learn. Yep, excellent. We will just grab those screws. I cannot tell you guys enough how nice it is to have a screw tray. Seriously, just get a couple cheap fridge magnets. Even just to put a magnet on the bottom of something to use. It's so valuable. Lose a screw and you're, you're screwed. So, definitely helpful. Highly recommend. Okay, so now comes the tricky task of trying to figure out how the rest of this is put together. It's clearly loose in the center here, but that means nothing unless we can get the whole computer open. I'm not really sure. Oh, the rest of this is held on. I don't want to force anything. I have a suspicion there's some screws hidden along this edge here. So we're going to take a look at that. Move this out of the way here. Okay, so the one side of the machine over there is coming off sort of smoothly. This side seems stiff. Something somewhere is holding this on. You can see, all oh, this back panel is moving. It doesn't want to come off, and I don't want to force it either. We're going to have to play a game of hot potato with the screwdrivers here. It's not a game I like to play, but we'll see. Remember kids, don't push too hard, you might snap plastic clips that you might find are important later. I hope that doesn't, didn't just happen, but one of the clips definitely broke. Apologies, you guys can't see this too well, I'm left-handed, so... The camera's a little bit trickier to showcase. I'm working down here. Playing some more screwdriver hot potato. If we can get a grip on this here, there we go. Oh. There's an LED down here that I'm trying to not, there we go, apply too much pressure on, too, and I don't want to break anything. Okay, so somewhere over the rainbow exists the way out of here. Hmm, it just feels like there's too much force here. Something somewhere here I feel like is screwed down. I just don't know what it is, and I don't want to pull too hard for fear of that whatever that is breaking right off. Well, I see another screw here. That's one thing. I'm hoping I find screws back here. It's helping to explain why this computer doesn't want to come apart. Hopefully I haven't wrecked any screw posts or bent any screws, if this is the case. The key to doing this, if you're not able to use a hairdryer, is to be extremely slow and careful with where you apply your pressure and how much pressure. Because you could snap something. If you don't let the adhesive slowly let go, and even then, this is still not as good as using a hair dryer and melt and getting the adhesive loose, but you really must do it this way. Be very slow and gentle. One wrong move, and you could snap this plastic piece. I've done it before, so. Be very careful. Also, this is also not smart, doing it this close to the screen with nothing to protect it, but... At this point, as you can see, yeah, that was scary. At this point, options for me are low. Whew! 
All right. That is that panel off. Looks like there might still be enough adhesive to put it back. What screws do we have holding this in? Hmm. That's fine. I don't see a single screw here. There's always a case of screws that you missed. In this case, I see two right here. I have no idea if they mean anything, but I'm taking them out anyways because at this point, I'm trying anything and everything to get this open. Okay, well that was this side, it seems. There was also this in a USB port. You see how I bent it because I didn't realize. Because it was literally like this in there. I did not know. This is a Bluetooth adapter or a wireless adapter or something. That's weird. I've never seen a computer do this as an OEM thing. Weird. Okay. So that seems to have loosened it up a lot. Let's see if we can get the whole thing open. I have a distinct suspicion the disk drive is holding this side in. If you look here, you should just be able to bank out a little ridge right here. Ah, which makes me think. Two screws. It's always screws. Mm. All right, let's get them off. It was actually more painful than most laptops I've worked on. But with the whoosh, wiggle and a whoosh, get this to come off. There we go. Good grief. Okay, so as expected, there is a pretty large three and a half inch drive here. Which is kind of crazy. I wish I had kept one of mine that I had. This is interesting. I want to see if there's an SSD somewhere in here. I feel like there's enough room they could have fit one in somewhere. If not, we're going to put it here where the disk drive used to go. See if we can boot off of it. Got a couple more screws to remove this IO shield. We'll take a look at what's under the hood. Maybe it's even socketable. That would be great. Okay, lifting everything off, you can see a very interesting board. Here's the Wi-Fi antenna down here. Here's that random USB port, which is kind of strange. It's a USB 2. Definitely interesting. We have another slot in here, which suggests we could put an M SATA drive in here, which would be cool. I might consider doing that. We can also see our two DIMMs. We can see another big chip here, which is interesting. We can see a... Drop that here. We can see two fans here, which is very nice. It's got a dual fan set up for this heat pipe, and the CPU is socketed. At the top here, we have what I believe is an old graphics card interface. Don't quote me on that. We have some more basic I.O. on this side. You can see it's interesting that we have a little bit of I.O. here, and just a smidge of I.O. here. And then some of it's sort of around here. The I.O. is bounced around a lot of different places. It's very interesting. Okay, well, let's take this off. There's some space underneath. I want to see if what we have here. We could see a adapter here that goes to a slim line, which these are fantastic by the way. So we see we have this is going to a power port on the motherboard, kind of like a laptop. And then we have an actual SATA connector running to SATA right here. And we have a SATA connector here that's running to a hard drive here. Now I'm only counting two SATA connectors, so I don't think we have anything else going on underneath these. But I want to see what options we have to work with, especially this. This is intriguing. Looking at the bracket here, what's really interesting is this, the eject switch here, which is lit up, is actually corresponding to this external switch. But the drive they have in here already has an eject switch on it. Meaning that they just used a standard laptop hard drive and then added it an extra switch for some reason. Also note, this is a slot loading. DVD drive, which is actually really cool. I would have preferred a Blu-ray drive, but this still excellent thing to have. I will definitely be keeping that. Also note, looking underneath, I'm sure you can tell by now, there's no space here for anything of the kind. A lot of this space is actually taken up by the very large LCD panel at the back. So with this removed, we're just going to follow around where this eject wire goes, and we're going to unplug it from the motherboard. Looking a little bit closer, you can see this 4-pin connector, which has 
one of the pins blanked. And you've got two wires going through here. It looks like a common ground of some kind, and then two data wires. Or perhaps this is a short that's triggering the mechanism, and then we have positive and negative. Here's the drive, slot loading. Here's the uh, built-in eject button. And then here's the eject button that they actually use, which has a little LED in it. It's interesting. So we'll go ahead and take this out. You can see we just have a couple of small screws. We'll set this to the side for now, and we'll go move on to what might go here. I will say that everything is easy to work on once you go through the nightmare of getting this thing open. Close some of your information. We see it's labeled March 2008. It's a Hitachi Desk Star drive, so nothing special here. It's a SATA th at three gigabytes per second. That sounds like SATA one, I believe. Uh, I'm looking through here. Capacity 320 gigabytes. So again, nothing special, but certainly doable. I may throw in a bracket if I have one, and put in a used one terabyte drive. We shall see. Interface on the back. Yeah, excellent stuff. So the last thing I think we're going to do is we're going to be removing these and see what we have underneath this hood here. It's pretty nice that we have these connectors on board. We can definitely utilize those for extra fun goodies. But yeah, let's get these up. Now it's going to be a little bit tricky to see, but there are some very small screws here. Alright, so now, just breaking off the thermal paste, we're going to undo our fans, which are over there, and then we'll have a look. Alright, so we just have a series of screws here holding these fans in place, as well as some fan connectors, but we'll be keeping those the same, likely. The board itself looks pretty clean, I'm not going to lie, but of course, as with most things, the cooling system definitely could use a clean. That's going to improve thermal performance by a lot, especially in these older machines. Thermals are a big deal. So what's interesting to know here is this fan doesn't have any heat pipe going through it at all. It's literally just a fan that vents to nothing. And there's no way that it's going anywhere. It looks like this is the only heat pipe for the computer. And somehow it's using that tiny little piece right at the end, if it's doing anything at all, to vent into this fan. So that fan's useless. I'm probably just going to take that out. That's just making things louder. So... Underneath this disgusting thermal paste, which I definitely want to get replaced, we have a PGA 478 socket, which is interesting news. More importantly, we've got ourselves what appears to be an Intel processor. Okay, so looking at the numbers, it appears, to the best of my knowledge, this is an Intel Core 2 Duo, clocked at 2 gigahertz with a 2 megabyte cache. And I don't know what the 667 means. Any of you who are nerdier people than I am will know. But this is a decent processor. It's a two core, four thread, I believe. It's not bad. Definitely could upgrade this, although we might not have to. We'll see. And I've decided that I can't really spend too much on this project. I really need to try and just use what I have available to me. And so I shall. So I'm not going to be using this M SATA port on here. It's certainly a nice feature to have. And in normal circumstances, I would. But we're not going to for this video and for this project, considering this is a giveaway build and I don't have a lot of funds to work with at the moment. I'm going to not use that. Instead, I'm going to replace the DVD drive because people don't use those anyways with a caddy and we're going to put an SSD in there that we'll hopefully we'll be able to boot off of. And then we'll use our 320 gigabyte hard drive for some extra storage. So we'll wipe this. So taking a look at our RAM display case of death here, we're going to go through and see if we see anything better than what we currently have in this laptop which I remind you again is four gigabytes in two DIMMs, so two times two gigabytes of DDR2 at 667 megahertz. We're gonna try and find something better. So far I've found one four gigabyte stick at 800 megahertz. Yeah, after looking through all my RAM, I was only able to find, once again, that four gigabyte stick and two more two gigabyte sticks, which are even slower at 640 megahertz. So 
that really wouldn't be something I could use. I mean, I could put these in there and it'd probably still be okay, but I'm gonna opt for the 667 and I'm gonna try and stick with dual channel. So I think the ones that were already in there should be okay. So this is a hard drive caddy that's meant mainly for laptops, but it'll work for us in this case. What it does is it has a slimline SATA connector on it that normally DVD drives and other drives plug into, and inside it has a caddy for a hard drive for SSD, which is fantastic. These are usually go for around 10 bucks, I've noticed, so they should be more than a welcome change to this computer, and I don't think they're going to complain about not having a disk drive in the modern age. I use them all the time. I love disk drives. I love watching DVDs and movies and things, but most people have moved on, so this should be fine. Next, I got this 1999 SSD from Best Buy. It's 120 gig, which will be plenty of space for some programs and for running our boot system. So I'm hoping we'll be able to run it off of this as a boot drive. I've never tested this as a boot drive, um, only just switching it around using this as extra storage. So we'll see if this works as boot. Okay, so before I put this whole thing back together, I'm going to give all this a clean. I'm going to clean the processor, do a little bit of research on this socket and see what kind of upgrade paths I have and how quickly I'll be able to go get access to them. And then we'll price out what we're looking for and get some other options. And we'll get back to this real quick. Alright, it's been a couple of days now. If you couldn't tell from me changing my clothes all the time with the long sleeves suddenly appearing and whatnot, I've always been working on this intermittently through the course of a few days and I had to just take another day to sleep and get a couple more things that I needed. The last thing we're going to need is some thermal paste. I just picked this up from my local Best Buy. It's about $7.99 so relatively comparable to prices you get on Amazon. So really I'm paying for the convenience but I'm not paying too much for it. So um, I believe I paid about 4 or 5 for one that was a reputable brand on Amazon. Again not necessary but I do would like to get a brand just to make sure that it is well designed. So we'll be putting some thermal paste on this and buttoning everything up back together. Off camera, I did a little bit of work on this. The Loctite glued fan blade appears to be working well. There's the occasional little hitch there, as you can see here, like that. Once in a while we'll do that, but for the most part it's pretty good. I did have to take two of the screws and raise up this plate a little bit just because it was scraping back here a lot. So now it's mostly alleviated the issue and there's still two front screws on the top and this whole heat sink is still in there um, pretty solidly so it should still work pretty well. I don't think we'll have any clearance issues but this is just to make sure that this has maximum clearance on it so it's been raised up a little bit. We shouldn't have too many additional problems. we put this back together. So, we're just going to put some thermal paste on the CPU die, and then we'll be buttoning everything back up and giving this a test. I gave another coat of paint onto the green on the back of the computer. It's not perfect, it's got some issues here and there, but it should be pretty good for the most part. So again, we'll just put everything back together. So there's no necessary method or madness to this. There are many guides you can look on on the ideal scenario for putting thermal paste on this. I'm going to just put on a small sized dot on the CPU. I'm going to put a little bit more than I normally would because I had to sand some of the block so there's some scratches and marks in there that would not normally be there. Um, we'll just use the tip here to move that more towards the center here. You just want very good coverage. You don't want, you want as very little overspray, if you will, as possible with the CPU paste but it's not as big of a deal as ensuring complete coverage. So now we're going to just gingerly lay this on top, trying to make sure that we line up all of the screws correctly. I can already feel the paste adhering. We'll just push down. And we're lined up on all of our screws. Obviously this is a little bit of a weird scenario, but most cases the screws will be attached to the CPU cooler itself and you want to go diagonally when you're pushing it down. That just is pretty good practice. It ensures more thorough and even coverage. It ensures as little twisting and warping of the cooler as possible. It's, it's just good practices. It's not strictly necessary, but I would advise getting in the habit of doing it just for the off chance that doing it wrong might have an effect on performance somewhat. It just depends. Every system is different. Now we're going to just screw down the fan again. 
Again, we have that small gap going on there, but if you can just kind of see it right in there, but there's plenty of room, so that gap shouldn't be an issue. I'm not feeling any scraping. Oh, there's a... There's perhaps a little bit going on, but it looks like it should be fine. We should barely hear it. We might hear the slightest little scrape going on, but after a while, it'll sort of wear down that spot and it shouldn't be a huge issue. Not <laughs> not best practice, but I just wasn't able to switch out the fan blade. I didn't really want to have to clean the other fan blade and risk breaking both, just in case something else happened. Doing a little bit of a comparison here. Here is the original fan can see how much cleaner it is now that I've gone in there with a little bit of isopropyl and water and cleaned it up. Left it for quite a while to dry before I put it back together because you don't want any water left in the system whatsoever. But yeah, much cleaner. And this is when I didn't have the heat sink there building up extra dust, so yeah. That was pretty filthy. So now that we have most of this computer put back together, I'm going to go ahead and do a very rough test fit with the back panel of this, just to make sure we, I didn't put cables in the wrong spot or anything, so I'm going to go get that. I'll be right back. There we go. Let's see. You can see some overspray in there, but that's not a big deal. You'll likely never see that. That comes with the cover on it, so... And we look to be in the clear. Now, interesting thing to talk about here for a minute. There's this... I.O. shield of sorts on the back. Normally, not a huge deal to leave this off on your computers. In this case, however, and again, I will make sure that you check before you just really, really throw this in the trash. This actually has a number of different screw ports in it that are actually threads for screws. And I believe especially the stand itself plugs in here because I don't see a spot really in here where it can go. So the stand will actually plug in here for the back of this all-in-one computer, so I really actually have to keep this. So be aware, don't just throw out your IO shield. Make sure it's actually legitimately not serving any purpose before you get rid of it. In most cases, it's not a huge deal to throw out the IO shield, but yeah, I would recommend doing that. Off-camera, I also did a little bit of cleaning in here too, just to make sure that it's nice and clean before we put the computer back together. Alright, so the IO shield has been basically screwed back in, so the computer's pretty solid now. I put it into all the screw holes. I have a feeling a couple of these, especially these down here, will be reserved for when we put the front panel back on, but I thought I'd put all of them on just in case, and we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, this is one of the blemishes on the computer. Most of the back is okay. There's a little bit of overspray on it. It's a little bit tricky to see. Um, you shouldn't really see it because it'll be like this most of the time, but unfortunately on the front here, you could see I did a rookie mistake and put way too much paint on the front here, and now... It's got drip marks on the back here. I don't really have any nice sandpaper that I'm going to be able to use to sand it down and make it look nice and even, so I'm going to have to just sort of live with that, which is unfortunate, but for the most part, we should be okay. So let's put this in. So that's where it goes. There's a panel that goes over the back here, obviously. But it looks like we should be able to screw this front in first without this. Let's do that. Uh-oh, dropped a screw. Hopefully that's not needed for something important later on. Two screws here, so there's one here. Got the rest of the panels over here. Obviously there is no disk drive in here anymore, so this panel is kind of useless now, but I kind of wanted to keep the light that goes on, just because it adds a little bit of extra color to the back here and something interesting going on. So the light's attached to the eject button, which again, really weird that it's external with another eject button, but regardless. Um, I have this piece of tape put over it. This is sort of the reason why I wanted to paint it anyways. And there's obviously a little bit of a gap there, so that we should get a little bit of an ambient glow from the blue light that goes in there. So that we'll just sit over it like this and then we'll see a little bit of that light glow there this was something interesting and you can't actually push the button which is exactly what I want while we're already here this gives us a chance to look at some of the uh, 
part of the I.O. The I.O. is sort of split into two sections here with some front I.O. up there at the top there. But this is sort of the more discrete I.O. that you'd find at the back of a desktop computer. So you got three USB 2.0 ports here. You've got a LAN port, which is probably a gigabit Ethernet port. Is it? It looks like it is according to the designation. Uh, don't quote me on that. Then we have a SPDIF port. Um, you'd be forgiven for not knowing what that is, and I won't explain that in this video. And then we have an audio out port, which looks like a standard 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, which again, should be totally fine. And now you can see this overspray here, but this is just conformed to this back panel. None of this was ever touched. This had been lying on the table the entire time. So all these ports are in just as good or eh shape as they were originally. So should be good. All right, so with the computer laid down here, there's a little bit of a dilemma going on. There's two screws right here, and I'm not sure if the panel requires those screws for the panel itself, or if the computer needs to be screwed down in there. Looking at the panel, I think we're gonna need to screw these in. So I'm gonna screw these two screws in here, this one here and this one here. And then of course, we're gonna bring in the stand and screw it into these five screws right here before we bring the other panel in. It's got some slots that just pass by the two metal arms that are attached to the stand. So I'm gonna do that, and then we should be good to plug this in and power it on and test it and see if it works. All right, so and this is the front of the computer screen. You could see all of this gunk that's appearing on the side. This is the original adhesive. I'm not sure how much I trust this, so I'm gonna try and clean up the screen a little bit, and I'm gonna add some Loctite into some of these places just to make sure things are smooth and are gonna go on nicely, because this is it was literally almost entirely held in with glue. So I'm gonna try and make things look a little bit nicer. Just using a little 96% isopropyl alcohol. Be very careful of the edges of the screen when you do this, by the way. Also, don't do, I, don't do what I do when using a uh, relatively dirty rag here. Just be careful. And the screen will look like new in no time. sure if that's exactly how it's meant to go, but it seems like it is, so we're going to call that good. Alright, so the interest of not showing anybody what it looked like, I'm going to have the screen pointed that way, and then we're going to plug this in, boot it up. Please work. That's the power brick. Be very happy your power brick doesn't look like this anymore. We have an overkill Razer gaming keyboard that's going to be plugged into this thing. This is probably what's going to be used with the computer anyways. Let's see what sort of indicator lights we get on this. This computer did work before I took it apart. I wonder if it's just not getting enough power. Let's try plugging it into a dedicated outlet and see if it does anything different. Hmm. I turned off the lights here just so we can get a better idea of what's going on screen, which is a whole lot of nothing. I'm kind of worried that I somehow broke this screen. I saw it flicker on though. Let's see if you can see it on the camera. No, I didn't see anything. Let's wait for a full D power. Okay. That's unfortunate. I got a little bit of a scrape there on the front here. We'll try and cover that. This is a concern. Oh, did you see that? I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but the screen just flickered again. Not seeing anything on the computer. Hey guys, so we're back here. Um, obviously, the computer is not here. I had to take it upstairs to do some diagnosis and testing on it. And what I discovered was a couple of things. First, I opened the computer up and found I forgot to plug the fan in, so that's good. Good thing I didn't plug run the computer for too long. So I plugged that back in, and then I still wouldn't power up. So I sat down, I prayed, and I was like, oh, good grief, what's going on with this computer? And then I hit me. What RAM is in this computer? So I looked at the RAM, I took it out, and went back to my RAM cart. 
Now these are the RAM sticks that I put into the computer the first time when it wasn't booting. These are those crucial sticks that I showed you before. These are 640 megahertz DDR2, whatever. What I found out was the BIOS in this computer was actually pretty old, probably Windows XP era, which makes me now think that uh, it doesn't have pre-configurable um, RAM connectivity, and so it's not really cross-compatible with a lot of different RAM types. So I had another set of what was likely the original RAM, which was actually a higher frequency. I mistakenly thought these were the original RAM. We actually had other ones that were 666 megahertz um, from what looks to be some sort of um, DH company. So likely those are first party and um, direct from manufacturing. So that's probably why they chose those. They probably got a pretty good deal. Although I still don't get why they didn't use HP, but whatever. Anyways, so I put those in the computer and the computer booted right up immediately. So happy. So I finally went through, fixed everything into the computer systems, went through, did the whole Fakey phony feng shui profile shenanigans where I set up my own Microsoft account and then went in there, made a new profile, went into the old profile, deleted the existing profile. You know, all, all those fun, clever shenanigans that you always do whenever you're working with these systems. But I got everything set up, got the new desktop background in there, and uh, got everything all set up, ready to go. So that really concludes this video, actually. A little bit of a strange end to this, I know, but um, I'm going to be delivering this to the person who needs it uh, on Sunday, which is like a couple days from now, and I will give you guys an update in the comment section to let you guys know what happens. So thank you guys very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.